Dear colleagues, by means of this video, we will learn how to choose a cooling tower. Nowadays, this choice is usually demanded to suppliers, and this is correct because they are the experts. But nevertheless, we want to understand which parameters are affecting the choice and which physical principles are behind. So we will be able to judge on our own. And uh, to make it easy, we consider only one type, which is the wet cooling tower and the counter flow, like in the picture right above. The cooling towers are used both in civil and in industrial environment for process cooling. There are many other ways to cool a water flow, but the specialty of the cooling towers is that no refrigerant is needed, no compressors, and therefore less power than for chillers. On the other way, the cooling temperature which can be achieved is depending upon the ambient conditions. The water gets consumed and it requires treatment. Let's see how it works and how to select it. The water to be cooled is pumped into the upper side of the tower where there are the spray nozzles. The water is there atomized and drops into a fill pack where it encounters the air flowing in the opposite direction. Part of the water evaporates and takes the heat away from the remaining liquid water. Finally, the cooling water is collected into a basin from where it is pumped back to the system. Let's make now an energy and mass balance across a tower. The heat lost by the water, Q, is evaporated and makes temperature drop. That way we can determine the evaporation loss, but the energy lost by the water is also gained by the air. Its enthalpy increase. The evaporation loss equals the air stream humidity increase. And by means of those two equations, we can find the mass of the air and also the living condition of the air in terms of enthalpy and in terms of humidity. So definitely, the enthalpy of the entry air the absolute humidity of the entry air, they are given, while the enthalpy and the humidity of the living air, they must be determined by those equations. Let's start with an example. Starting from the ambient condition, we know the temperature of the air and its relative humidity. On the right side, we have a picture with the cooling tower and the position number five is the entry of the air and by means of the psychrometric chart we can determine the wet bulb temperature and the corresponding enthalpy h1 from the process side we know the flow 103 cubic meter per hour the entry and the living temperature which corresponds to the position 1 and 8 in the uh, picture and therefore we can determine the heat transfer 1200 kilowatt and the mass of the water which evaporates 0.5 kilogram per second. To solve the air mass flow, we need the psychrometric diagram. The P1 is the starting condition, the ambient temperature plus humidity. And here the P2 is the wet bulb, 21.4 degrees. And the first approach is that the temperature of the living water must be at least 3 degrees higher than the wet bulb, otherwise the heat transfer is not possible. And then we have a second approach saying that the living condition of the air, so the point P3, must be 2 degrees at least lower than the entry temperature of the water, this vertical line, and the position 9 in this uh, picture. And of course, this condition says that the air is saturated, so 100%. From the chart, we can read also the enthalpy values, so the H2 for the point P3, the H1 for the point P2, and uh, thanks to this uh, uh, formula, we can determine the mass flow 21.9 kg per second. But we are not sure that is the right value because we need to satisfy also the second equation for the mass balance. The mass uh, given by this uh, equation is a little bit higher, 22.2. The mass balance says that the water evaporated is uh, increasing the humidity of the air. And the humidity 
we can read also from the chart. This is the starting value and this is the leaving value of the stream. Eventually the right value is the second one, 18.6 cubic meter per second. Thanks to the error flow rate, we can select the tower size after choosing the type and the quantity of cells. This is a manual selection chart. There are uh, for sure many automatic tools, but we want to learn. And uh, so in the, this uh, example, we can determine the size of the tower looking for the air flow. And eventually we get the model. A couple of words, what's concern the regulation. Actually, it depends upon the circuit. And uh, let's take a very simple one, a single loop. Typically, the users are provided with flow control valves, like in this case, to keep constant flow rate across the heat exchanger. And in this case, we need just to provide a constant pressure before the users by means of the frequency drive of the pump. What about the tower fan? Our suggestion is to use also here a frequency drive according to the delivery temperature of the water. Let's see why. Let's assume that the load drops to 50%. And um, in this case, both the water flow and the air flow are becoming the health. There will be two regulation ways. Considering the power fan 11 kW, we can either stop and start the fan, working half of the time, but every time at 100% or reduce the speed working at 50% of the load but constantly. What is energetically better? In the first case, the power is the maximum but the time is the health and we get 5.5 kilowatt times operational time. In the second case, the time will be the same will be the full time, but the power is one eighth of the maximum power. Eventually we get 1.4 kilowatt times operational time. Why? The reason is that between the power and the flow of a fan, axial fan in this case, uh, there is a cubical law. So the power is proportional to the cube of the air flow. In this case, the mass flow will be the health, so the power will be one eighth. That's the reason why it's always preferable to operate constantly but with frequency drive rather than start and stop the fun. Thanks for your attendance. I hope you have enjoyed. See you again.